Good morning. Welcome to the Worship of Almighty God here at Wexford Community Presbyterian Church. My name is Tyler. I'm the pastor here. It is a wonderful day to be together, a wonderful time to worship God. And we're so glad that you're here. Thank you for being here. Let's worship God. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall All those lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus When a life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were no One of the joys that we have in getting together each and every week is being able to pass the peace of Christ, being able to greet one another with the love of Christ. We do this in this virtual space by asking you to pause the video, reach out to someone, email them, text them, call them, do whatever you need to uh, let them know that you care about them and that you're glad that they're in your life. So let's take a moment, let's pause the video, and let's pass the peace of Christ. This week, there's something uh, that I want to try. Uh, we're going to take two weeks to do it, and uh, I think it'll be really neat. So in two weeks, on the 21st of August, I want to do a question and an answer sermon. And so just a, a sermon where I'm answering questions. Questions that you might have about God, about the Bible, about the church, about Presbyterian church, about life, the universe, and everything. About anything that you want. And I'll take uh, the best questions and I will, or the most pressing questions, and uh, we'll just answer them within the context of the service. So uh, in order to fill up the questions, we're gonna take two weeks to do this. So if you're able to, if you have a question, if you have any question at all, um, send it to me uh, at tyler at wexfordcpc.org. 
and uh, just let me know if you have a question for the for the question and answer for the good questions service and uh, and we'll get to it if we get enough questions then we'll maybe make this a regular thing I, I really like it just to see where folks are and, and any question you have whether it's a question about stuff that happens in the church or, or stuff the church is doing now specifically about Wexford about the big church about Presbyterianism about the Bible about a long time ago any question is good so uh, ask a good question at Tyler at WexfordCPC.org uh, and again when we read them on the thing uh, we'll just, we'll, I'll read the questions but I won't say who they came from so if you're embarrassed about asking a question I'll know that you asked it but other, no one else will so ask whatever your question there's no bad questions and, uh, and we'll do that in a couple weeks I'm really excited for it Lord in your mercy hear our prayer Almighty God in Christ you taught us to pray and promised that we would receive all that we ask in his name hear now our prayers for the Church Universal, for this congregation, its mission and ministry, for the healing of the earth, for peace and justice in the world, for nations and leaders, for our local community, for the poor and the oppressed, for the bereaved and lonely, for all who need healing. Guide us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, that all of our prayers and all of our lives may serve your will and show your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. Listen to the word of the Lord. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. The elders in the past were approved because they showed faith. By faith, we understand that the universe has been created by a word from God, so that the visible came into existence from the invisible. By faith, Abel, Abel offered a better sacrifice to God than Cain, which showed that he was righteous, since God gave approval to him for his gift. Though he died, he's still speaking through faith. By faith, Enoch was taken so that he didn't see death, and he wasn't found because God took him up. He was given approval for having pleased God before he was taken up. It's impossible to please God without faith because the one who draws near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards people who try to find him. By faith, Noah responded by godly fear and he was warned about events he had not yet seen. He built an ark to deliver his household. With his faith, he criticized the world and became an heir of the righteousness that, become, that comes from faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out, of, out, of, out to a place where he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out without knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived in a land where he had been, where he, a land he'd been promised as a stranger. He lived in tents along with Isaac and Jacob, who were co-heirs of the same promise. He was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose architect and builder was God. By faith, even Sarah received the ability to have a child, though her, she herself was barren and past the age of having children, because she believed that no one who, prom who was promised, because she believed that no one who promised was faithful. So descendants were born from one man, and he was as good as dead that were as many as the number of stars in the sky and as countless as the grains of sand on the seashore. All these people died in faith without receiving the promises, but they saw the promises from the distance and welcomed. They confessed that they were strangers and immigrants on earth. People who say this kind of thing make it clear that they are looking for a homeland. If they had been thinking about the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return to it. But at this point in time, they are longing for a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God isn't ashamed to be called their God. He has prepared a city for them. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was probably in college, I was about 20, I watched the movie Citizen Kane for the first time. Uh, Citizen Kane is largely touted as the best film ever made. Uh, it's very impressive, even if you don't like it. I think it's great, but even if you don't like it, there's a lot of things in it that make it pretty impressive. Uh, largely because it was the first film to do any of that stuff. Um, just in terms of the way the things are shot, the, the way in which the camera is used, the acting, uh, it's, it's a very impressive movie. What makes it the most impressive though, and what kind of stuck with me at that point was that Orson Welles, who wrote and directed and produced it and starred in it, was 25 when he made it. And uh, he brought along his troupe from theater and radio, and many of them were contemporaries of his. So there were a lot of them were in their 20s. And they're wearing makeup to go anywhere from age, I think, 19 uh, up through age 70 in the movie. And it's incredibly impressive. So again, I watched this. I'm 20 years old when I see it for the first time. And I think, okay, I've got five years to make Citizen Kane. Uh, and I didn't. By the time I was 25, I hadn't made uh, any movies. That was, that was his first movie. So I thought, I don't need to make movies before then. I just need to make the one great movie. Uh, I didn't. I haven't made any movies. I haven't written any books. I haven't uh, done any of those amazing things. Uh, and so I set this kind of barometer of what success was, and it was Orson Welles. And, uh, and then uh, I wasn't able to do that. And so on a certain level, part of me thought, well, I'll never be Orson Welles. And uh, as I've gotten older, there's a certain amount of things... Uh, I think we may have even mentioned this before that we, when we're young, we have kind of categories in life. We've got things that we've done and things that we might do slash will do. And then once you hit a certain point, maybe around 30, you, you develop a third category and that third category is things that I will never do. And, and so there's the things that we've done, things that we, we might do that we will do. We just haven't done them yet. And then things that we'll never do. And slowly the things from that middle category, start moving over from things that I might do to things that I'll never do. It may be run a marathon. It may be travel around the world before I have kids, or it may be uh, become an astronaut. Any of these things that are exciting when you're young, for me, it was make Citizen Kane. Uh, and you start to realize, I, I think I'm never going to do that. And in a lot of ways, uh, that's a whole other issue that it could be, it's an important thing of accepting that we don't have to do everything. We'll kind of get into that in just a second. But the, in a lot of ways, we base our worth on what we have done. This passage in Hebrews is often used as it's the passage called the heroes of the Bible, the heroes of the New Testament, the heroes of Scripture, not the New Testament, the Old, Old Testament guys, uh, but the heroes of faith. And so people use this chapter as like, look at them, they did all great stuff. That's not what this chapter is saying. So first thing is that this is the book of Hebrews. It's a letter to the Jewish population in the Roman Empire. Uh, and it's speaking largely to people who would understand scripture, to would understand this. Uh, it is sometimes called a Pauline letter, meaning it was written by Paul. Uh, it almost certainly was not written by Paul. So more than half of the New Testament was written by this guy, Paul. Paul was, um, he was a Pharisee, so like a, 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 a religious leader uh, who was against these new Christians. He was named Saul at that point, and he started to persecute them and even put them to death because he was trying to eradicate it. He saw it as a terrible thing where these heathens were saying lies about God and it's really pulling people away from the faith. So he's trying to purify the church. And in the middle of doing that, um, he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus. This light shines down and blinds him and he has this conversion. He sees Jesus and he understands everything. And then he becomes the great evangelist of the New Testament. So the vast majority of the New Testament writings are letters that Paul wrote to churches. And because of he had written so much of it that so many of the other letters get thrown into Paul. And there's certain ones that it's probably not Paul that wrote it. Hebrews is definitely one. So Paul has this kind of like quick, aggressive style. One of the problems is that 
uh, when we look at the Bible, it all kind of has the same voice. It's been blended all together. Um, it's like if you take a bunch of colors of Play-Doh and then you roll them all together and then like kind of work them all out, then they just become this weird brown color and you can't distinguish the different colors anymore. And each of the books of the Bible, especially in the New Testament, have been kind of blended together in translation so much that it's hard to have the distinct voices of each of the books. And so they kind of feel the same. So we don't notice because the Bible's originally written in Greek, the New Testament, in Koine Greek, ancient Greek, uh, that there's a real different style to it. If you think of like writers that you have, so Paul would write uh, really aggressively and kind of like, he's like an angry writer, like a Norman Mailer or someone like that. And, and Hebrews is not written like that. He, Hebrews is written very elegant, very fluid, very florid, um, almost like a Jane Austen or someone like that, that you would notice the difference in these writing styles, even though they're writing the same language, they would have a different way of communicating. And so, uh, or like an Anne Lamott, so uh, to do more contemporary. So Hebrews is like more of an Anne Lamott kind of writing style. And so it almost certainly isn't Paul. It never claims to be Paul. And, and in fact, Paul always claims when he's written a letter and this one doesn't. It's not claimed at all, which makes most scholars believe that Hebrews was written not by Paul and not by somebody else, not, not by Paulus or Luke or, or other people like that who would have put their name on it, but probably by a woman. Priscilla and Aquila were two people at this time that would have been in that place and they were uh, supporters of the church and really important people in the church, um, funding a lot of what was happening in the church and, and important voices. And Paul does talk about them as teachers and things like that. And so this was almost certainly written by a woman and at some point in the church they took that name off uh, and I just kind of clipped it off and it and it as the canon was being made it got put in there now I tell you that not to say oh the Bible's all edited uh, yeah the Bible's written by people and divinely inspired by God but we've kind of through translations and stuff we we interpret it and one of those interpretations at some point in the church they decided that it wasn't acceptable uh, to ha to have women be voices within the church, uh, especially in these later stories where just cutting that off doesn't change the content of it, it just changes the implications. And so uh, that likely got excised for that reason, likely. Uh, at the very least, we know this isn't Paul. This is someone else who, ha who no other book in the Bible sounds like this one. And basically what Hebrews is doing, this whole thing is speaking to the Jewish people, to the church people who know scripture, so be us, people who know the stories of the Old Testament, who are familiar with it, regardless of how familiar with you are, and saying in this chapter that faith is important. And uh, to get us back to the, to the uh, to where we started with, with Citizen Kane is that it's saying, look at all these heroes, basically, uh, or this is how we read it, of the, of the Old Testament and how much faith they had. Isn't it great that they had faith? And so a lot of times we use this to say, so you need to have faith. Have faith like Abel, who gave what he needed to give. Have faith like Noah, that even as the world was ending, he didn't give up on God. Have faith like Abraham, who traveled and followed what God was saying and did all these great things. But the, the thing that we miss is when we say that, we imply that because of their actions, they were rewarded. And that's not what this passage is saying. This passage is, say this passage is saying that God is good and they responded with faith. And their faith was a sign of what God was doing. So uh, it's not saying that these ones were the best and no one else made it in. It's saying that uh, these folks, these different people had faith that God was telling the truth, that God was there to help us, that God, God's promises would be made full. And as we'll see going into next week, a big theme of that is that uh, none of these guys, literally all guys in this story, and then the, there's women there and the women at, at one point, um, none of them saw the promises completely fulfilled. And we'll talk about that later, but that does feed into this where it's saying that's not the point. The point is not seeing the promise fulfilled. The point is living in a way that makes the promise true. 
So faith is a really important word. Faith is to get into to Greek a little bit again. Faith is uh, in in English we treat it like a noun. It's something that you have. I have faith. I lost faith. I need some more faith. I don't have enough faith. Uh, I've got too much faith in this. Like you've got too much faith in the Pirates. They don't want to win. You don't have enough faith in the Steelers to be able to pull this out. I don't know why sports metaphors are coming in right now. Uh, and we act like it's a commodity that we can have too much of, not enough of, or just right. And that's not how the word faith is supposed to work. In Greek and in Hebrew, which is what the Old Testament is written in, faith is a, is a verb. Uh, if you ever gotten an email from me, it's at the bottom of my email. If you ever gotten a card from me, I have business cards that I have I stopped giving out six years ago. So still have a big stack of them, but who gives out business cards anymore? Anyway, it says faith is a verb, do something on my thing. Uh, and that is true. Faith is not a noun. It's not something that you have. It's something that you do. And th what this passage is talking about is the actions of all of these people. They didn't just believe that Jesus was that, that God was going to fulfill these promises. They actually acted in such a way to trust it. Um, it's almost like a trust fall, that when you do a trust fall, you, it's one thing to say, I believe you will catch me, and we don't need to go through this practice. It's another thing to actually put your hand in your body in gravity's hands and let it fall and trust that the person's going to be there when you catch, when, to catch you. Um, the big difference between our understanding of belief and the true understanding of faith. Faith is doing. If you're not doing it, then you don't have faith. Uh, as we said before, it, faith is like running. You can't have running. You do running. You are running or you're not running. You may have run in the past, and in order to consider yourself a runner, you have to be someone who runs on a fairly regular basis. You can't say, well, I ran in college and I'm now 50, but I'm still a runner even though I haven't run since college. No one would accept that. Uh, and yet, with faith, we say, well, I believed when I had this big moment at one point, and I did some really crazy things. Uh, but then since then, I kind of only leave, live within my means. I only live within the things that I can control that I trust in me. And I don't really do anything outside of the things that I can control or outside of the things that are, are part of the trajectory for me to meet my goals, which is to get a good job, to get enough money, to buy a nice house, to save enough money to retire, and then to not have to work for the last 10 years of my life. That's the goal. And anything outside of that goal, we don't really have space for. And people would say, if you step outside of that goal, that you're foolish. So what Hebrews is, the author of Hebrews at this point is saying, is that you need to have faith. And you need to have a faith that means something. You need to do something with your faith. And in each of these examples, they're using examples of these people, not who were making Citizen Kane and doing all these things and you should be like them. Even if we looked at it in the modern context, it would be like, look at Martin Luther King, who did all these amazing things and, and was so great in the face of racism and in the faith of people who wanted to kill him and he, and he responded with love. Look at... Uh, uh, all of all of the faithful folks that we've had who who have been able to be good in the face of something. Look at Jimmy Carter, who after losing the presidency went and founded uh, Habitat for Humanity, which builds homes, and that he is still at ninety some years old was teaching Sunday school to his kids. Look at or to his church. Look at Mister Rogers, who was kind all the time, and no matter how much we we want to try to dig up dirt on celebrities we can't dig up dirt on mr rogers and so we think be like mr rogers but then we think i'm not mr rogers i can't be like mr rogers i'm not martin luther king i can't be martin luther king i'm not any one of these people who are so good at caring for others uh so i'm really kind of lousy so a lot of times when we look at these people who have been great examples of faith put into action uh we feel bad about ourselves. We feel like we're not good enough. And that's not the goal of this passage. That's not the goal of the Bible. The goal of the Bible is to say, look at what faith looks like. There's a great, uh, there's a great quote by uh, uh, Cornell West, who's a professor, uh, ordained pastor. Uh, and he said, never forget that justice is what faith looks like in public, what love looks like in public. 
never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. That when we love, when we put our uh, belief into action, things change. So the biggest uh, thing that happens with faith is that we do something. The, uh, which is interesting because oftentimes what we think of when we think of faith is that we don't do anything. We get out of the way and we let Jesus take over our lives. And there's a, there's a terrible theological uh, example that we have in our modern culture. It is from uh, the latter-day theologian, Carrie Underwood. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't write it. Uh, it was from someone else. But one of the worst songs ever written, you could like it as much as you want, but from a, from a theological standpoint, is a song called Jesus Take the Wheel. Jesus Take the Wheel is her first real big hit, post-American Idol stuff, first big country hit. And Jesus Take the Wheel, the whole point of it is, uh, I'm giving my life to you, Jesus, which is a great theme. But literally, she is driving on a snowy road and she loses track of the car and she throws her hands up in the air. And so it's not even an analogy. It's Jesus, take the wheel, take it from my hands because I can't do this on my hand. Great general idea that we need Jesus' help, but she literally is letting go of control. If you're driving a car and you let go of the steering wheel and you expect Jesus to save you, I think your faith is probably not really understanding what the goal is. Jesus' faith for us, Jesus' purpose in our lives, what Jesus has given us as a gift, what God is doing, is not miraculously saving us from driving like idiots. Jesus is giving us the opportunity to do something in the world. That we have the freedom, when we have faith that God has saved us, when we have faith that God loves us, even when we're not Abraham, even when we're not Noah or any of these people, that we have then the ability to do good things, not because we are trying to earn something that we've already been given, but because we believe that God loves us and God can use us. We believe that we should hold on to the steering wheel because God has equipped us with people in our lives who taught us how to drive and that we should take part in what God is doing in the world, which is holding on to the steering wheel and not driving into uh, a, uh, a tree. <laughs> um, that sense of faith, faith that is in action, not faith that is accruing uh, love from God, accruing some kind of uh, uh, merit that will be rewarded, is the goal of this. When you look at uh, the classical paradigm, so one of the things in, uh, in the Bible is that the Bible is often compared to some of the classic stories of like uh, Hammurabi, Hammurabi's Code, and uh, Gilgamesh, and all of these other writings that were at similar times. But all of them have the hero's journey, which is this um, this uh, kind of classical paradigm of storytelling that Joseph Campbell is one of these people who talked about it. And the hero's journey happens in almost all of the literature. It doesn't really happen in the Bible because the hero's journey is the there and back again. So the hero leaves grows, learns something, and then returns home. So that is, Star Wars is very much that. It was based on the whole idea of that. It is the Odyssey and uh, the, those stories of like, you go away, you do miraculous things, but then you return home and you return home a changed person. That doesn't happen in the Bible. People go away and they never come back. Uh, Abraham, which is kind of the focus, one of the main focuses of this passage, is one of the best examples of that. Abraham goes away and death isn't the end. Death isn't the return home. You don't go home at death. You can keep going. The death is not the end. That's what makes this different. That's what the point is, is that we're not returning back to God. We are part going on a journey that continues past the grave and continues on to this restored place and that the, the home that we return to, the, the restored heaven and earth is a new place. It's not that we are new, it's that the destination is new. And, it, and so then it becomes not about the destination, not about returning back. It's about the journey that we're on right now. The faith is not building up for something that will bring us back. The faith is helping us to keep moving forward, to keep doing things that we wouldn't have done otherwise. I was talking about sports a little bit ago. I'll bring it back to sports again just for a second. Uh, faith that God has 
already saved us, that God has equipped us with what we have, that God is working in and through us, uh, which is what all of these stories are about, is akin to if, if you, one of the unique things about football is that it's the only sport that I can think of where the officials can, can make a call in the middle of a play and the play can keep going. Uh, if there's a foul or something in basketball, they blow the whistle, it stops. If there's something that happens in baseball, it stops. The, the call is made right away. Uh, you don't keep playing for a while and then they go back and say, oh, by the way, uh, 30 seconds ago, this happened. And so we're gonna go back to that. That doesn't ever really happen in any other sports except that regularly happens in football. There are times in football uh, where we say, they, oh, they got a free play. And I, it took me a while to understand this when I was a kid. Uh, they don't really get a free play. What happens is that the ball has been snapped and one of the refs sees something happens and they throw their flag. There's certain offenses that they'll blow the whistle and stop the play, but a lot, of, most of the offenses, they'll just throw a flag and that flag means that there is some kind of penalty on the play. But the, the offensive team knows that they have a free play, meaning that they, uh, they can go big and they can throw it all the way down. If it's an interception, then the, it will probably be ruled negative ruled ruled like the, it's like the play never happened because at the end they'll be like well there's a flag on the play and the offense knows well it wasn't against us so we can call it back and if it was against it, it was against the other team and they do get 80 yards on this passing play they're going to reject the penalty because they get the choice as to whether or not it happens and uh then they can bring it back faith as it's understood in this context is like having a free play we have the opportunity to know that we can do something bigger than we should, bigger than we feel comfortable with because we know that we will still be safe. We know that God is with us. God is encouraging us to do things that are outside of our comfort zone. Not Jesus take the wheel, not throw our hands up and be dangerous, not things that will wreck our lives and other people's lives, but things that we will, will make us, it's within the football player's realm of possibility to do this thing but it may be a risky thing to do. What faith is letting us do, faith in God is letting us step outside of that comfort zone and, and go big, do something bigger than what we would normally do. Again, not ridiculous, not take your hands off the wheel, but to do something different. When we see God as equipping us to love others, then we have a different type of faith. When we see God as someone who only rewards those who are good and punishes those who are evil, then we our faith is really nowhere. Our faith is in fear. Our faith is in, well, I better be good for goodness sake because I don't want to get destroyed. If we think of the God of Noah and that story, a God that will kill and destroy everyone who displeases God, which is not the point of that story, but that's how we usually understand that story, then we're not going to believe that God is on our side. We're going to believe that God wants, us, wants to kill us unless we are perfect. And Noah, it turns out, wasn't perfect because sin didn't go away when the whole world was, was destroyed. And Noah and his family were the only ones who brought it through. But God, at the end of that story, says, yeah, that wasn't the point. That doesn't work. You can't destroy evil with evil. And I'll never do that again. And the whole point of that story is really just more than anything a metaphor to let us know we don't want a God who destroys evil because we're all evil. We want a God who loves and forgives and is a God of mercy that uh, does away with evil by loving the people who are broken and helping them realize that they can do more. Not judging themselves based on the things that they haven't done. And not even judging themselves on the things that they have done. But judging themselves on a God who loves them, even in the midst of these lists, and lets them know that there's still a lot of things that you can do. And you should be have the courage to do those things. Because those things affect other people and help them to live their lives. Faith, as it says in this, is hope in things unseen. That it can be a trite thing to say, faith is believing in something you can't prove. It's not what it's saying. Faith is 
believing in something that you can feel, believing in something that, that is a bit of a risk, but in believing in something that's good. Love between people, between friends, between romantic partners, uh, between people that you trust, that requires faith. You can't prove it. You can demonstrate that, that this person is involved, but you can't prove it. You have to trust it. Such it is with God. The belief in God, the belief that God is doing something is a belief in love because God is love. And God's love for us is what helps us to define ourselves. When we have belief in that God, not the God of destruction, but the God of equipping people to become different and to go on a journey that they never would have gone on before, then we can see that it's worth it for us to go on that journey, to, to step outside of our comfort zone, to participate with other people, to bless other people, to, to be participating in what God is doing in the world. Part of the faith that we have is not believing that this world needs to be destroyed and that we're just waiting around to be sent somewhere else, but instead believing that this world can be fixed because that is the story that God has for us, that this world will be restored and made new and that everyone is worth saving. And that requires faith. That is the faith that Jesus avails us, is understanding God is love. God is not wrath. God is not anger. God is not judgment or hatred or destruction. God is creation. God is love. Have faith in that God. Take part in what that God is doing in the world. Seek that God and love the way that God loves you, the way that God loves others. But keep your hands on the wheel. Amen. Seems like all I could see was the struggle. that lived in my past Bound up in shackles of all my failures Wondering how long is this gonna last Then you look at this prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight that's already been won. I am redeemed. You said. I'm 
not the same And I hope that will carry me home I am redeemed You set me free So I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain Cause I'm not who I used to be God, I'm not who I used to be. Jesus, I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. Thank God, redeemed. So now it's time for us to go. It is now. Uh almost nighttime. Uh, the sun is going down. The cicadas are louder or quieter. I don't know. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too annoying. Uh, but it's time for us to go. It's time for us to leave this place. It's time for us to go back into our regular scheduled lives and enjoy uh, the summer nights and the summer mornings and the summer days. The beauty that God has, has put around us. Uh, let's enjoy the people that we've been put in, in in their lives for this day. Let us know that as we go that we aren't bringing God to the world but we are following God into a world in which God is alive and active, bearing witness to what God is doing in all that we say and do. So let's go and let's help others to see a God who is good, to have faith in a God who loves them and who is doing things right now, who is leading us to a place that is different, but is leading us there together. So let's go. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Have a great night. Hopefully this wasn't too dark. Have a great day. Great morning, I guess. Whenever you're watching this. Uh, enjoy the day. And do good things. We'll see you next week.